So, what do they like, this new crew of yours? Well, I would have to say they are decidedly motley. There's been nothing but drama since we left Earth orbit. And I'm told it's been continuing since I saw them last. everyone welcome to deep space pride a gay star trek podcast i am one of your hosts johnson lee and with me is mike thorlo hey johnson hey mike how are you today i am good how are you doing good happy monday how was your day happy monday uh, i wasn't too bad it was a good productive monday i have to say i'm pretty happy with this monday so hopefully that'll carry through the week Wait, but you had a 10 a.m. meeting today, right? Those are the I words. did have a 10 a.m. meeting this morning, yes. yes. Um, that's a little rough to start your week off with. but Always a little uh, dreadful. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was fine. It was yeah. a good, actually a good meeting. Not bad um, as far as staff meetings go. Great. So let's talk about Picard season one. Yeah. So, yeah. So this we recorded again a few months ago. And... There, we had a lot of opinions. We had a lot of thoughts. We did, yeah. Um, one of the things uh, why why I chose the opening uh, quotes from uh, Will and Picard talking in uh, Nepenthe is, uh, you know, this crew is filled with drama. And so much uh, drama. I'm not sure we actually, I don't recall if we actually talked about how much drama there is. Obviously, we talked about the drama, but I'm not sure we, in our actual recap, talked about the extent to which there was drama. And there's a lot of drama. There is a lot of drama. I mean, baggage. everyone seems to be carrying baggage on this ship. So um, much baggage. So, and when you don't death, deal with your baggage, murder, you have drama. A lot of murder. A lot of death, actually. Everyone's, yes, there, a lot of there's death. death everywhere. Mm-hmm. There is. Yeah. Uh, bad motherhood. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, I don't, um, you know, I... I I think that it is interesting because, you know, the way that Picard talks about his crew when he's talking to Will in that scene, and he's like, yeah, you guys were, I don't remember the exact wording, but he's like, yeah, you guys were like, fine. And this crew, this Motley crew, you know, there's so much drama. It's really true. And it's such a stark, it's also in some ways very meta in the approach to the character building of the TNG era versus now, where now, like, to build a proper drama and a narrative, you have to have really complex characters that have a lot of dark pasts, you know. Well, Gene Rodney didn't believe in any of that. He believed that everybody exactly. got along, um, which doesn't, doesn't really work for drama. And all of the drama from, you know, a lot of Next Generation was external to the crew. So, mm-hmm. you know, the... Except for, you know, what really comes to mind when thinking of drama and the crew was when um, Picard goes on that mission. And I can't think of his the captain's name, but Ronnie Cox plays him, um, plays the captain. It's a two-parter uh, where he c- takes over and he has a completely different style and Riker actually resigns. Oh, Chain of Command? Yes, there we go. Nice. See, I love that you can pick off these episodes <laughs> just like that. Um, but that was I'm a time, that was a time. I mean, obviously Gene was dead at this point. He had passed on. And, um, but I don't think if Gene had ever had been around, I don't think that this episode would have ever played yeah. um, like it did. Um, but uh, there was a lot of drama in that, that, uh, yeah. that uh, crew, which is antithetical to what Gene Roddenberry thought of. And now jump ahead 25 years from that point (laughs) now here we are with a crew that is really i mean the crew is really a reflection of life as we live it right now i mean honestly like you're i i've dated a lot of people you you have been on dates Mm -hmm. Uh, i mean people come with a lot of baggage and sometimes you realize it sometimes you don't 
Um, but you, you know, we carry around a lot with us and, um, you know, I think that, that this is a very realistic, hopefully group. not so much death and murder, but correct. Yeah. So we don't, yes, I, yes, we'll, 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 we'll say no to the death and murder part. I, I hope I, I've yeah. not, uh, I've not dated anybody who has had that kind of baggage. Um, That'd be so, um that would be quite dark a and sexy maybe not no uh, dark yes sexy no scary <laughs> maybe um, it was like death happening around them versus like them actually killing people like ooh. Uh, yeah maybe um yeah so ooh, um but but uh this crew has definitely got got its share of uh problems and i mean honestly the at the peak of what are we going into the 26th century 20, uh, no, 25th, 25th century. century you know uh again this is i mean we're 2020 is quite a tumultuous year for us humans um so not only yeah, it's interesting and, you know what you're saying about the way that these stories are formed is a very much a product of the time you know, I'm rewatching the original series right there you go. yeah we're having a lot of side conversations about this where even though it's a series that's supposed to reflect the 23rd century and such it is still very much a product of its time. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, so it's unavoidable. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's I mean, ne- you know, next generation really is, it's actually quite clean as far as that kind of stuff goes. I mean, there are certain episodes that are probably more controversial. One of the things that probably is a sign of its times is how next generation dealt with, gender on the outcast that that if we look at it from a lens from now to then um or bring that episode to the now it really doesn't hold up um, oh yeah for sure from that it's kind still of fascinating i think it it's it culturally culturally definitely. fascinating but you know definitely the original series carries a lot more of that baggage of the times whereas sure. next generation is very very a lot cleaner a lot, oh, yeah. a lot more, um, yeah, less controversial, uh, more utopian, almost kind of. Well, I mean, that's how Gene envisioned it uh, until Deep Space Nine, and you know that yeah, wasn't actually Gene's sure. creation. That was, um, the, you know, Michael Piller and Jerry Taylor and and Rick Berman. Oh, yes, yes. Um, so I mean, Deep Space Nine was created by the three of them. So. Um, and rightfully so, I think to kind of contrast the drama of having characters who didn't necessarily get along. Um, and for those of you who are not watching this, but I, I am, oh, I'm watching I'm Johnson play with his hair in the camera, uh, because y'all are going to see this, not. I see it. While we're recording, yes. So wait, so the whole point of what we were trying to talk about when it comes to the intro is that not only is Picard's tr- crew dramatic, we are dramatic. <laughs> we are. That was the whole point. That was the whole point. It was, as, it was kind of an in-joke. We as that, gays are occasionally dramatic. Yes. And yes. we're a motley crew at that. We I are, actually don't even think I'm that dramatic. No, but you have your moments. I have moments, but I think overall I'm very level-headed. You know, am I? I don't know. I don't know. I need a. I need some outside observer to kind of judge that. But I think I'm fine. I don't think I'm that dramatic. You're not that <laughs> dramatic. I'm not very dramatic. No, you're not no. very dramatic at all. I have my moments, and Dennis flips out. Not flips. Dennis out. has his moments. De- Dennis, Dennis has his moments. Do you know, Dennis inadvertently is dramatic and sometimes he's just, he's like, oops, I spilled all this tea. And where did this tea even come from? And I'm like, I don't, I don't need this tea right now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Especially if you get one or two drinks in him, it's kind of all over. Yeah. He'll just talk about anything and everything. It's like, there's no vaults. It's like nope. The vault's, there is the no vault's vault. loose, the door's gone. It's like, everything spills. <laughs> Yes, yes, um, yes. He shares details of our lives uh, with all of you, and you know, and you just kind of look at him, and you're like, "What are you doing?" And he's like, he's he's clutching his pearls, and he's like, "What? <laughs> what? What do you mean?" 
So yes, there are moments like that. Yes, there are moments, yes, where I would like to choose to share certain details with all of you and where he just outright says them with no filter. So yes. So anyway, everyone, we hope you enjoy our recap slash review of Picard's first season. Yeah, and just some caveats for this. Uh, obviously, this was, this was uh, almost five months ago. This is actually still part of our first five recording. Five months ago? I feel the time is changing. I said, I said no, a few no, months well, ago. Well, <laughs> so it was from uh, March 28th. 2020 and we are uh well into our four and a half months beyond that all right um so nearly five months ago um so it is uh it is our first first recorded episode it's part two you listen hopefully to to some of part one on our what what our thoughts were of the series finale uh, season finale not series finale season finale and now we now we talk about the whole uh, whole season as a whole, and uh, so there is possibly a little audio cut out here or there um, with our internet issues, and our audio isn't as glorious and beautiful as it is now with these wonderful new mics. But and your new mesh router, well, and I'm router. running a mesh router now, which improves our internet connection. Mm-hmm. Although Dennis would say otherwise, um, but that's a story really? for another podcast yeah. different conversation different conversation anyway we hope you'll enjoy this recap of season one of picard so now let's talk about season one of picard yeah so mike what do you what do, what are your overall thoughts about season one of picard so i check picard i i really enjoyed it i I think someone once said, and Picard is the Picard is who we need right now, and I totally agree with that because um, I don't know. I I really identify with who Picard is, even though he may not be who that person is at the beginning of the season. Mm-hmm. Um, this person who, uh, for me, really ident- like I think of Picard, and I think of integrity, and mm-hmm. I think that that is the the running theme through Picard everything Picard's ever done is just this sense of integrity Mm -hmm. um yeah I mean there are are some points of arrogance you know because you know when you as a person and even speaking personally like if I get into my integrity too much that can come off as arrogance Mm -hmm. um because what happens when you are so full of integrity you get kind of like if you you get judgmental and you get like sure. yeah so um so i i mean obviously there were some downbeats but i think you know i there's some things i really didn't like like girardi i am not a fan of girardi and yeah. um, i don't think i ever will be um but i love rafi um i love elnor uh, and I'm really sad that we didn't get more of Laris and Zabon. Uh, yeah. Because yeah. she, I love Laris, love her. I really wish, like, I hope that they bring her, somehow figure a way to bring her back on board um, and, like, whatever way. They were great. They were, yeah. the it was really good. They were, um, they were, they were put yeah. Picard in this place, like, listen old man you know like when he was the old man right he was kind of like this grumpy old man um so um i would love to see them again so i thought that they were a really nice piece of um the first part and actually speaking about the integrity piece that came up in the interview with uh the federation news person or whatever it was Mm -hmm. uh Mm -hmm. or fox news of the future god help us (laughs) um (laughs) but um because that's that's a typical that that's actually that's speaking of that point particularly that that person that um news person is exactly the type of news person that i can't stand and that i would associate with something like fox news is like Mm -hmm. you know i promise i'm not going to talk about yeah i promise i wouldn't talk to you about this Mm -hmm. and i'm going to break my rule like Mm -hmm. You know, I guess I I really wished he would have gotten up and not 
done the whole um, speech about Starfleet and getting mad on screen, like he should have been like, listen, that's not what we're here to talk about. Interview over. Um, but he didn't, obviously. Um, you know, uh, I can't stand Clancy either. She's a hard <laughs> ass. Um, but they, but I love you know, my issue with Clancy is that the writers I felt, and I know you're still talking, but the writers I felt they <laughs> almost went the lazy way with her mm. and just made her drop f bombs to make her seem like a hard ass, yeah, slash, like bitch, you know, yeah. And I was just like, why drop it? Why do you need to drop these f bombs on John Luke? Like it's so unnecessary. Yeah, it, you know, it's, it's, I don't know why they decided to do that and. Mm. I f bombs on Star Trek, even though I think I think Michael Shabom had an interview about this where fans were asking him about like oh why the cursing and he's like well I think cursing is important to you know in our language blah 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 but it just felt very off like even when they do on Discovery once in a while it just does it pulls me out because it's such mm. a twenty first twenty 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 first century colloquialism yeah even right. like lower curses in the nineteenth century are very different from what they are now. So for yeah, them, right, yeah. like <clears throat> right. modern day colloquialisms like that, um, yeah. it pulled me out a little bit. If they had like other curse words like frat on um, Battle Africa, that's right. Like, okay. But yeah. like, I don't know. Anyway, sorry. No, but I, 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 really, I, were, I thought they were lazy with Clancy as a character. I know she was mm -hmm. like around for like five minutes, but like they just made her drop f bombs to make her look like you know look like a foil to the card. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Which I mean, you kind of get a little more depth to her in the book in the book uh, but again she still is like someone who's a hard liner in the book as well so but the thing about a, the book is like not to get to in the book but there are moments when they do align you know like yeah she, yeah she was she was she was a hard sell on the whole way to help the romulans but eventually she was she was also like no we have to help them you know like, yeah but then she got in, stuck in the political machinations and when when worlds were wanting to secede from the Federation, right. she was like, oh, you know, you know, she was looking at trying to save the Federation over, well, first of all, like 11 or 12 worlds, and again, we're talking about the book, which we should probably do a whole different episode on. Oh my but, God. Um, but I think like, the, like why would you panic? Like, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I guess politics is not my strong point. I'll say that right off the bat. I don't like talking about it, but in this instance, I'll just say like 11 or 12 countries decided to secede from the United Nations. Like, fine, go ahead. But that's like, a problem because like if, if the UN says like, okay, you guys can go, wasn't, wouldn't that make other countries feel like, oh, so are we also, you know, uh, we, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. You yeah. know, if you're going to prioritize this, mission over mm. the integrity of you know our yeah. union okay you know like i think that it's a there's a large story there besides the, you know 10 to 14 um clients yeah. that okay all right well yeah. so she had to deal with that but um yeah she i guess she was kind of a foil for for picard but um you know I, I, in the end she did come he did convince her to come around and obviously she sent the fleet um which i thought was going to be like oh you know i'll send 10 or 12 ships and like do it the deep space nine way where they just send like a small armada and no, they sent the whole, whole thing, whole kit and kaboodle um, yeah. of these new starships, which are look definitely like badass, like ready for battle type ships, mm -hmm. um, which makes me wonder. Very and, and hope, angular design. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it makes me wonder how we're making those ships now, 15 years later. Mm -hmm. um and also um you know what's the what's the what's the universe like outside of what we've seen in picard right you know right. we know that the border between the romulans and federation is kind of like free man space now and there's the mm -hmm. whatever group seven was part of um the riders well, i don't know riders yeah, riders something the riders. whatever they are yeah and um so i think that the the political the geopolitical landscape of the future of this time frame is is interesting and they're approaching the year 2500 so um you know we could be right. seeing kind of the beginnings of the downfall of the federation as i think is going to be explored in discovery yes um, so so i think there's some interesting tie-ins there um 
So, yeah, I, I thought, you know, obviously if you chop up the season into like little bits, you've got like one episodes one, two, and three are kind of like the beginning. Mm-hmm. And then you have like four and five are kind of like these standalone episodes, I think that um and i can't remember too much about four and i i should probably pull it up on my at least the list of the episodes up in my four box. was free cloud oh, i thought five was free cloud what? let's see let's see um but i felt like there were a couple of standalone episodes like the free cloud oh no five right. was free cloud you're right because four at the end of four that's when that's when um seven comes on Ah, uh, okay. Let's go through this. All four right, was so when they. Four was when they go to. Absolute, that oh, absolute candor. Yeah. So four, yeah. they pick up Elnor. Five um, is free cloud. Five and is four, they pick up seven, and at in five is free cloud. Six, Six was the impossible box. So uh, track Soji to the board cube. Oh, so they go to the, the board cube. cube. Seven was the Pente. Pente, yeah. Eight was Anything. broken pieces, and then the finale, two parts yes, finale. Yes, yes, yes. So yeah, so I mean, absolute candor. I which you know, honestly, like as a as a theory and practice, would be really interesting if we practiced more absolute candor in our in our twenty first century lives. But anyway, um, uh, so that was yeah. I felt like four and five were kind of like these standalone episodes where we pick up obviously a couple of crew members. Um, and then we move into the next phase, which is kind of like the board cube that we've been teased about mm-hmm. throughout. Yeah. And then we go home back to the next generation for Nepenthe, which, as you said earlier, uh, it had all the feels. You're right. And I would right. probably go back and watch that one again, along with the Star City, Stardust City rag, um, mm-hmm. if I wanted a standalone one. Um, and then there's kind of like the penultimate episode broken pieces and then uh the two-part finale so um yeah. you know i i felt like it you know it and the funny thing is like so i don't know how many episodes they wrote to begin with but they kept on saying like somewhere in the first three episodes i think they expanded it maybe it was going to be a two-part opener and it became a three-part yeah, they, they so, added yeah. so it's interesting i wonder how it changed on the back end mm-hmm or whether they were only shooting nine episodes and they decided to make it 10. Um, right. But I felt like it, you know, it definitely it had blocks, which makes sense uh, from both a production standpoint, but also from a story standpoint. Um, and then, yeah, I felt like it really ended, ended strong, you know, pretty strongly. I mean, it, you know, it, it, again, like this, I, I would go back and watch this whole season from start to finish. Mm-hmm. would i with other would would so and you asked me the question earlier before we start recording so you asked me earlier if um if we compare this to other first seasons of other star treks mm-hmm. and i would have to say that i would watch i mean it's shorter this is the shortest first season out yeah. of all of them mm-hmm. uh except maybe well i don't except for the animated series um so I think this would I, this would be something that I would watch again, pretty much all the way through. Like I wouldn't have to. This would be like I could do other things and watch the whole first season of this if I wanted. Yeah. yeah. Some comfort season where I didn't have to think and I could peek up at cool time, like interesting times, and um, and then just enjoy it and feel like I'm like some like certainly now and. and where when we're talking about this, you know, March 28th, 2020, um, you know, this, this would be like comfort food for, for the soul right now. Um, so I definitely would watch, watch the whole season through again. I mean, I might skip parts, but so yeah. So I think that this is something I would, I would probably give this, I mean, an eight, 8.5 8.5 maybe a 9 for the whole season I think that okay. um you know I feel uh, yeah I feel like it's a strong season it's a story arc which I like mm-hmm. um you see Picard change and develop through all of this you get mm-hmm. all of the emotions from Picard mm-hmm. um which this is his show so it's it's about him so if you yeah. know everyone else is kind of secondary you you've got these other characters that, uh, you know, I kind of like, um, mm-hmm. for the most part. Um, 
so I think it's uh, I think it's gonna be good. I I um, I'm looking forward to more. And and the other thing too, I would say is like I thought your point or before when we were talking about the this um, series finale, I think that you know you don't like you don't like the multimedia aspect of it, and I I agree with that to a point, but I also like that you can dig into these other things and um like mm -hmm. learning where laris and zabon came from and seeing rafi and the verity um and seeing at least a, a mission mm -hmm. of saving the romulans in the comic countdown is certainly accessible to most people um and if you're if you really want to have that additional piece you can if you don't you don't have to i don't think you really lose anything but mm -hmm. it gives you a little bit more of the tie i really like the book i think that the book not that it's required reading, but I think it offers a lot more context for everything. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and it just makes it better. It doesn't, you know, I think it would be fine without it. And most people will probably be fine without it. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I think it added a lot of context to what we saw on screen this season. And so yeah. I think it's, you know, I highly recommend it. And I think we should probably do an episode on just the book. Yeah. You know, I about that time could. frame. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think, you know, I, I kind of, and I, I mean, I kind of wish they had plotted out a little bit more and given us a, you know, it would have been nice to have two or three books during the season. Um, but um, I know that they've greenlit more books. So that's. Oh, have they? Really, yeah, they have. Oh, okay. So that's, that's really cool. Um, okay. So, yeah. So I'm, uh, I, I thought it was a definite, I'll give it eight. I'll, I'll do a nine just because I like more even numbers, but. It's you know between eight point five and nine for me. Um, okay. Very very little that. I mean, my biggest complaint about this season is Girardi, but mm -hmm. um, that is actually the the only detractor, the only major detractor, and that they killed Hugh, which I'm kind of like. But I think that they you know you can't you, you in in TV in this day and age you kind of have to be prepared for those moments where they sure. are, yeah. you know mm -hmm. i mean game of thrones and you know all these other shows have kind of created this thing where you can't be tied to the actors sure. or the characters like yes. if it develops the story then it develops the story i don't know that hugh's death developed the story other than for seven to eventually kill narissa that's it right. which you know in all reality we didn't we mm -hmm. saw her fall Mm -hmm. didn't see her die yes, yes so um you know whereas with elnor you see mm -hmm. that the romulans head being sliced off like he's right. dead right she fell um so just like the emperor fell in in return of the jedi and they bring it they bring him yeah. back in episode yeah. nine but anyway um not to cross our our sci-fi cross franchises yes yeah, so our franchises let's because uh -huh. we know for some unknown reason that there is this undercurrent of uh star wars versus star trek which i am a fan of both and yeah i like both um, yeah so i don't know why people have to choose but anyway um yeah. so that's my sum up of the season and and obviously as we kind of go through this we'll watch some next gen episodes and we'll it'll bring back more about what we saw in um in um in this season so i'm sure we'll be talking about this season for a while mm -hmm. all right so what did you think about season one of picard what score would you give it yeah so you know overall um i like the season i i kind of wish i loved the season um if i was to compare the season one of picard to most other season ones of other star trek series um, I would say it's pretty good. Like, you know, season one of TNG was not good. It was like very on and off. I mean, we were also talking like a 22 episode season and it's more episodic, but you know, it was very hit or miss. Season one of DS9 was hit or miss. Voyager was hit or miss. Enterprise was also hit or miss. Honestly, I thought the most, I thought the strongest season one was probably Discovery, personally. Mm -hmm. um, simply due to um, the pacing, the world building. Um, there was like this sense of purpose throughout the whole season. 
that I thought really helped carry through. Also um, another redemption kind of storyline as well. Yes, it was very, yeah, for Michael yeah. Burnham, it was yeah. about her kind of redeeming it herself. Um, but this whole like Korean War backdrop, I thought was a good catalyst of the entire season. Um, even going into the Mirror Universe and everything, I thought, not to go into Discovery too much, but um, I thought that that was, season one had a very strong framework that really carried each episode. Um, like I said earlier, when I was talking about the finale, I definitely think that um, season one of Picard was, uh, it's much more methodical. Um, it's much more like, it's much more introspective when it comes to how, you know, it's very character centric. When it comes to um, the focus on Picard, um, I think the biggest thing for me was tr trying to get used to this Picard, um, a Picard that we haven't seen for 20 years, you know, 15, 20 years. Right. Um, he just felt very different. And, you, and that for me was a shift because he was much less on TNG and honestly, most of the movies, he was just so in control of himself. Uh, um, to what you're saying about his character, um, obviously that hasn't changed in terms of his his want his character. You know, he has a very high integrity. Um, he, ha he the way that he carries himself is still a certain way. But in Picard, you see him. You see a much more weathered version of him. Um, and you can also potentially blame it on his. Um, you know, on his brain disease, aromatic syndrome, whatever it is, um, that he, he seemed like much less in control of himself um, at certain points. Um, but he's also like 94 years old, apparently. Right, so yeah. It took me a while to really get used to him being back on screen and him being in a much different place than where we left him in Nemesis. Um, and honestly, like even throughout all TNG, he, he so, so he's only like lost his temper like a like a few times, like yeah. once in first contact. Um, even I'm trying to think like in TNG, there were a couple of times like maybe in like the drumhead when he was like really pissed off that the admiral was kind of like you know doing a witch hunt in his, like around the crew and stuff like that. But like there was like a few months like that, but this was just very hard to wrap my head around. Um, so that was definitely a factor for me. Um, but I thought that that was good. Like I didn't mind it. Eventually, it took me a while to get used to it, and I didn't ultimately did not mind that. Um, you know, that is the Picard that we have to work with. Um, my bigger issue, and I also kind of alluded this in when I was talking about the finale, is I felt that there were just so many missed opportunities. And by that, for example, Q, right? We know that Q was coming back as a character um, and he just shows up in episode two or three. They barely name him. I think uh, Soji, or he, Soji says his name once or he says his, his name once, he's the director. Um, but, I'm like, okay, but where have you been the last 25 years since we saw you in Descent Part 2, you know? Um, and the whole thing with the artifacts and it's a dialect core cube that, you know, the Romulans are kind of, you know, they're, strip, um, they're stripping it of technology to sell and stuff like that. But then the Federation has some people there for the Reclamation Project. It's just like, I. There was like this world to explore. I don't feel that they really did a lot of the world building they could have. And this is maybe also could speak to what you were saying earlier about, you know, what is the state of the galaxy right now? You know, like what is the state of the Federation? Um, the Klingon Empire was not even mentioned. Like, you know, like what's going on with them? Right. Um, you know, like, you know, this, this is also like, uh, probably around like 20 years after the, the Dominion War. So like, you know, how has the Federation changed and stuff? Like there's so many things that I feel mm -hmm. they could have touched on, but then they just throw Hugh in or they throw the Spore Cube in. Um, and I'm just like, well, but, you know, but what? You know, like, and 
I just wanted more of that. And given how, how they pace the season, I feel that they could have given us more of that world building, especially when it comes to the character building. For example, a great example would be Seven Hugh seemed to have a little bit of history because Seven was like, oh, where's Hugh? Like, you know, but we weren't given anything about their background. You know, they're both like XBs or whatever. Right. But it's like, I, it would have been so great to kind of flush that out a little bit so that Hugh's death meant more to Seven, you know? Yeah, right. And so that when Seven kills Narissa, it means more because he was, she was like, that's our Hugh. But then it was like, but did you know Hugh? You know, like things like that, I feel mm. like they really could have like done more with. Um, and what I was saying before about like the show kind of like doing all this fan service and then kind of edging the fans, but then like not really like letting them come. Like, I'm just like, you know, you're, because the one thing that the show is really good at is the continuity aspect because they like do all these throwbacks to like, you know, like sometimes it's like, you know, it, they just do mentions like, oh, the Bacar maneuver or whatever, right. you know, but yeah. I appreciate stuff like that. Um, and they definitely have throwbacks to like the history, even Bruce Maddox, which was, he was only mentioned like twice in TNG. Um, once in Measure of a Man and once in Data's Day when you find out that Data is like corresponding with him. But that's been like the only time that you even hear about Bruce Maddox and they bring him back and like, okay, you know, that's cool. So there's like this, um, I think they're really good with continuity, which Discovery wasn't, but you know, I think that Picard is very good with continuity. and Except sure for the Sung Brothers thing. Like, the, like that, that's, that's the only continuity thing that I'm not quite... Yeah, that was almost like a retcon to me. I was just like, yeah, yeah, that was a big retcon of the season. Like, yeah, otherwise, yeah, otherwise, I feel that they've been pretty good with the continuity aspect. So, given that, you know, I wish that they not only they not only like kind of mention they do these mentions, but actually they also flush it out. You know, like I would have loved to know where he, you know, how did you go from being a leader of this other Borg ship of all these like Borgs that were disconnected from the co collective to being the director of the Borg reclamation prop, you know, like yeah, that's true. Um, there are just like things like that that I felt were just missed opportunities um, that I think that would have really given um, some moments more emotional resonance. Mm. Um, well, I think that that's the, the difference between Discovery and Picard, though. Uh, Picard is really about the, the man and the world around him mm -hmm. versus Discovery is obviously this starship-based, you know, show where they're going exploring or whatnot. So I think that that's sort of where the difference lies. This is much more of a, like, not a procedural, but, you know, it's much more of a character although discovery's got great characters but this yeah. is all about one character in particular and well, then... but discovery i would i would actually have some of the same similar issues with discovery in that it's very focused on michael burnham um mm -hmm. and the secondary characters other than like spock in season two and pike in season two um you know don't really get as much like it's very different because you're not talking about a 22 episode season where you can have one episode that's focused on one character, like, yeah, you know, right. like all the old shows were like, you know, yeah. um, even in discovery, like Michael Burnham is like the central focus of every episode over a 12, 13 course, ep uh, 12, 13 episode season. Um, yeah. I mean, there were some episodes though that she wasn't really the focus of, although I can't, I'd have to go back and really, I there was really that different. one in season two that was about Arium, the cyborg. Oh, Arium, yeah, that yeah. was really good. That was actually yeah. really good, but yeah. um, you didn't really get much of that. You know, it was yeah. mostly about Michael Burnham um, in season one dealing with her arc, her redemption arc, and season two dealing with the Red Angel, which was her. But yeah, um, that's true. I mean, yeah, it does uh, it does have to. But yeah, I mean, I think world building. I mean, maybe this like now that we've kind of got this new Picard um we'll be able to see more worlds and kind of build out because obviously now like the situation is resolved this situation is resolved and now what's going to be next I mean this it sounds like the universe in the 
26th century. What is it? 20, yeah, we're approaching the 26th century. I think it's the 25th now. It's the turn of the 25th century. Like okay. 24th to 25th. Um, 2399. So- 23, oh, is it? Oh, 2399. So it's going to be the year 2400. Got it right. Yeah. I thought, I, yeah. So I think like we're going to see the what the universe looks like in what the galaxy looks like in the 24th century, 25th century. 24th, 25th, 23rd, 25th, 25th, 25th. 25th. going into the 25th century. Yeah. So I think, um, I think that that will also, we'll get some of that world building because obviously the rangers or whatever they are called they're out there managing some of the border between romulans and and the federation and mm-hmm. then you know like you said we haven't really talked about the klingons um you know we've got Jordy out there we've got Guinan who's coming back next season mm-hmm. um which is exciting uh i that'll be really cool to see what they do with her um you know, so I think, you know, we still got the Enterprise out there, which I think at some point they kind of have to. They have to. <clears throat> they have to bring that back, you yeah. know, and I, and I think bringing back Jordy and Worf, I think will will probably be the focus, like the stars of season two. Um, yeah. Or the guest stars, I should say, you know, um, and who knows who else may pop up. I, I can't think of anyone else I want to see. Um, you Beverly know. Crusher? No. Oh yeah. Well, you know, so yeah, that's true. Beverly and, and, um, and Wesley. Um, but yeah, I I don't know. Like again. Yeah. But I I mean, they, so there was only one real scene with Beverly in the book, right. Where he was telling her he was transferred and that was it. Yeah. And it was this very much like you've been a friend for my whole life. Mm -hmm. Um, so this whole romantic thing that's been kind of, in the background of next generation since the first season, really this yeah. sexual tension is never realized or, yeah. although it is in the books. So it is. So what, you know, that's the other, you know, piece that like half of the post nemesis books are now like kind of retcon because uh, Picard and Crusher did get together and they did have a son. So wait, what What are you talking yeah. about in the books, in the books, so there are other books, not Picard related. Oh, the books. other books. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, and also the Borg aren't around, or the Borg are destroyed. I mean, after those are, after the Destiny series. Yeah. Right. right yeah. 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 I read so, some. I read some books. Well, I read Destiny, and then as Picard was kind of announced and everything, I picked up the last book in the 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 last book in the Next Generation series, which oh. is called Collateral Damage, which is a really good book. Okay. Um, I mean, it doesn't, you don't, you don't need to know some of the history. I mean, reading, having read Destiny, I think is a good thing, but mm-hmm. you, the other stuff um, that's happened is kind of covered in a way that, you know, you don't, I didn't feel lost, which I was worried about okay. um, feeling, but uh, it's obvious that her, you know, Picard and Crusher are together and they have a son. And um, so I was like, did I miss something? In- yeah, no, no, no. So, that, so that's why that's why going back to this whole thing. That's why Beverly didn't come up because she really hasn't been a factor in this series at all. Yeah, uh, not even you know a scene in the book, and that's it. Whereas Jordy was always in there, and Worf was talked about and promoted to captain, and he's the captain of the flagship, the Enterprise. So, um, and so that's but obviously mm-hmm. that's like fifteen. 16 years ago from the Picard time frame. So anyway. Yeah. Well, Beverly, you know, could have showed up because he, Picard had that random doctor from oh, the yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, just given his prognosis. And I was yeah. like, if anyone, Beverly could have done this. That's you know? true. Yeah. So she knew yeah. about, she knew about like his. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Brain issue. Um, so. Mm. That was a, but that would be like a five minute cameo. You know, I don't think it would be worth uh, Gates yeah. McFadden's time. Maybe, maybe you know? not. Yeah. Um, but overall, I would grade, I would give season one of Picard a 7.5. Oh, yeah. wow. Yes. So, which is good. I mean, good in my mind is 7.5. Um, great would be like an 8.5, and excellent would be a 9.5 or something. So, okay. All right. Yes. So I thought it was past. It was like better than passing. <laughs> better than passing. Um, basically. Um, yeah. I just think. Um, you know. Again, going back to what I was saying earlier, given that um, they they 
wanted a more deliberate pace. Um, I felt that they could have fleshed out Picard's role a little bit more so that, again, the characters around him um, felt more full. But, you know, I understand that at the end of the day, it's about Picard, it's about like his journey. And I do think that they give, you know, they gave in that respect, I thought that they did a good job, particularly with the way that they, they presented how he had all these issues around Data's death and how that was resolved by the end of the season. I thought that that was pulled off well and that was executed well, particularly given how, what we were saying earlier, like how it was done in Nemesis. Um, I, just felt, I just felt that there could be more around those characters around him, particularly if this is the crew that we're gonna be working with, you know? Um, and Picard had this one line to Riker that was really funny in the Nepenthe, Nepenthe episode where he was like, oh yeah, they seem to have like a lot more baggage than you, you're, you, know, you, you guys ever did. He said something like that. Yeah. And it's true, like they have like so many more issues. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel that, you know, they could have really like uh, delved more into them somehow. But, you know, um, but- Well, when you, know, you think about it, like Next Generation was, yeah. I mean, when you think about it though, Next Generation was kind of the first new modern series. Mm -hmm. um, it was this whole, like, obviously Gene Roddenberry launched it. So it was all about this idyllic society. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So there's that. And then no conflict, everyone's happy. Right. And then we get yeah. Deep Space Nine, which kind of gave more depth to the character, to characterization of Star Trek characters. Right. Uh, people weren't perfect. I mean, obviously, yeah. Ben's the main character, Ben Sisko, was angry at, you know, and the trauma. Like yeah, trauma. trauma. So um, it kind of brought the real world down. And then we go backwards to uh, sort of backwards, not to, yeah. I mean, the Voyager, Voyager was not like that. Voyager was very different. Yeah, Voyager was, yeah, uh, kind of bland in my opinion in a lot of ways, but. Um, yeah, and then Enterprise was kind of like, oh, let's go back and do a prequel yeah. of the original series and, right. you know, have, ha meanwhile, we have iPads and iPhones and they're still using flip switches and yeah, things yeah. like that on Enterprise. So it, that right. didn't really uh, do a lot for me. Um, and they talk about, talk about a series that left a lot of open-ended questions that they never resolved. Mm -hmm. um, this whole time war thing. And oh my gosh, the temporal cold war. Yes, that. that, yes. that Sorry, that time cool. time war is Doctor Who. Temporal cold ah! war. Temporal, temporal cold, cold war. war is Enterprise. So yeah, that yeah. talk about leaving things on the table. But yeah, I think that this uh, this series really uh, evokes what life is really like for humanity. Mm -hmm. Um, it's messy. Yes. It's messy. We make yes. mistakes. We regret things. We mm -hmm. um, and we have to make our way back to some to our own personal redemption, whatever that may be. Um, and I also think, like going, and I know you don't love Rafi like I do, but I think that part of I really I know you're shaking. Your head, <laughs> yeah. like, not at all. I know my ass. I cannot. <laughs> but I think Rafi represents. For me, and probably for a lot of people, like those lost friends that you've kind of lost touch with, you were close mm -hmm. for a really long time, mm -hmm. you either worked together or you grew up together or whatever, and you just kind of drifted apart, either through some situation, like obviously they had the, you know, the traumatic him quitting and her identifying this Romulan subplot, which she was right about all the time, mm -hmm. all along, and nobody believed her. Um, which also pisses me off because if she, she was, and in the book, she is like one of the top Romulan, uh, right. intelligence yeah. personnel. And so to not believe her, I mean, probably, O had something to do with that or other Tal Shiar agents and fe the Federation had something but to do with. The, so this is going into the book, but this is, yeah, a little I, bit. I mentioned this to you. I had issues with how they characterized John Luke's response to her, where he, oh, was, yeah, you mean, he was dismissive of her theory. Yep. Um, and he, then that carried through in the, the season as well. That yeah, and maybe that is what he said when he said you were right. 
maybe that was him admitting yeah. to that piece of it because it never right. you never really know what he said why he said right. that right but and she didn't she didn't put it together for us so like maybe um maybe this whole experience has made him realize that he should have said you were right all along yeah i just yeah, but I just thought it was odd for Jean Luc to be, especially since he, in the book, he characterized he's the way they characterize that characterizes the relationship between Jean Luc and Rafi, where basically Jean Luc is like, you know, enraptured with like how great an officer Rafi is, right? Yeah. Um, that he'd be so dismissive of her and her theory, like it just didn't feel like Jean Luc. That mm. was. That felt off to me. And but I think that that's where that integrity piece of his comes in because it becomes part of his ego. And he's like, well, I'm his, uh, I and everyone in the Starfleet and the Federation is full of integrity. So why would this ever happen? Like, he, maybe he, he couldn't grasp the idea that there was this big. But Robbie's, Robbie's theory was that there was more to the whole synth uprising and that, you know, maybe the Romulans are behind it. And then Picard was like, why would the Romulans want to right. do their own salvation, right? Like, but, right. you know, like, I just... Um, well, there's kind of another like, loose end. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. That was another loose end then. Yeah, I feel they almost did that just to create conflict between Jean-Luc and Rafi and yeah. give them the falling out, you know? And then I thought that... Even the whole, the whole thing where Jean Luc basically, you know, after he's dismissed from Starfleet, um, the way that he gives up, I kind of buy it, where it's like, because he can't save, he, he can't salvage the whole situation, he like kind of gives up. But at the same yeah. time, I'm like, does he give up like that? Like, you know, I don't know what he could have done, but, right. you know, to like completely abandon mm-hmm. like the situation and not make an attempt to save, like basically just completely walk away from it. Yeah. It and a little bit like off-cutting to me where I was like, I don't feel John Luke, the least of John Luke they knew would just give like, up that easy. He would, try, he would try to at least, yeah. you know, he wouldn't completely walk away. Like I feel like, I feel like he would like, you know, do whatever he still could. Yeah. Even as a civilian, you know, he still has connections. Like he right. could have. I um, think that that's the piece that, yeah, I think that that's the only troublesome character piece of Picard through this show mm-hmm. is like the whole idea that he would give up someone who like something so easily or apparently so easily mm-hmm. and then just go off and be hurt, like have his feelings hurt for 14 years before he decides to get off his ass and do something. Right. You know, like yeah. I think that that is that is the the only piece of this characterization and this character that I really struggle with is, is that. And I think you brought it right up to the forefront is like John, the, the Jean-Luc that we know, the JL that we know now. Oh, right. uh, I'm only saying that because I know it drives you crazy. <laughs> uh, the, that is the, that, that's the only hard part that I think we, I struggle with for this season right. is that he gave up and had his feelings hurt because they wouldn't listen to him and um you know he went home and became a vintner and uh you know like yeah um uh, which you know that ha- i thought the house burned down in generations right so is this yeah. a brand new house you know whatever um but anyway. oh, and another thing that we didn't even talk about oh. like like know that the i no longer understand how money and property operates in the Federation. Because oh, I yeah. thought like, yeah, like, you know, there's all money, but Rafi's living in a trailer out in the middle of the desert and Picard has a chateau. And then Rafi's also like, oh, you're living, you know, with your like antique furniture or whatever. I'm like, who cares about that shit anymore? No one should care yeah. about antique furniture anymore in this century. And like, why is she living in like a trailer in the middle of nowhere? You know, like it didn't. So I was also like, wait, so is she poor? but does money exist? You know, because that's another problem. Like, because now they're like introducing that they're, you know, they were both discharged from Starfleet, but because of their privilege, they live in very different situations. 
But I'm like, but does that kind of privilege still exist? This is really confusing, you know? That's true. Yeah, and I mean. That's one of the reasons why she's so bitter. Like, you know, that Picard can just go live this nice life on his nice vineyard and she needs, and she loses her family and needs to like live in the middle of nowhere and trail her. Like, I'm just like, but that doesn't make sense, you know? Um, she can also be, she can have her own vineyard, you know, like based upon like, you know, how things should be operating within the Federation by the 24th, 25th century. Yeah. Um, so that was also confusing because now they're introducing like modern day like problems into this, this world that is, you know, it, it kind of goes against like the world that was set up um, yeah. by Wannaberry, you know? So yeah. it's a little, that was also a little confusing. Yeah, I, I, yeah, that that is confusing, I think. But I also think like the whole idea that there is a utopian society um, is just unrealistic, even, even now looking at it and looking at it. I just, I think that, you know, yeah, you create this future and you, uh, and which, you know, at some point we'll talk about like how we got into Star Trek and all that. But, you know, I think one of the lessons I learned from the very early watching of Star Trek was that everyone was accepted for who they are, no matter what. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I mean, that, that in itself is the utopian society. I don't remember where money where I, maybe it wasn't even until the next generation where it was kind of identified that money is no longer a thing. Cause I can't think of anything. I'll have to do some research and see if it was ever mentioned in the original series, no, but um, definitely TNG. Um, is it the Ferengi, the Ferengi kind of brought that to light, I think at some point. Oh uh, yes. And then, um, but also deep space nine totally blows out of the water because you know, the rest of the, you know, outside of the Federation is all about money and like bartering and things like that. So, yeah. but it's, yeah, it's, it's, also, it's also a little bit fuzzy because now they introduce like Latinum and like yeah. how that operates, but then it more operates outside the Federation than within the Federation. Yeah. So that was a little bit, that was also a little fuzzy. But yeah. Then, you know, I was just like, um, you know, like, because, it's also like, yeah, there's, then there is, as I was saying earlier, there is this introduction of class privilege between mm. Picard and Rafi, um, where because Picard's family has had this vineyard, you know, he gets to live on it, and then Rafi gets to live in the desert in California or something, or wherever she is. Well, she was in, so she's in that famous... Uh, yeah, I don't remember what it's called. But yeah, I don't either, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah she's true. like she's like living as a destitute, and I'm like, mm, I don't know. Yeah, uh, that's true. I, yeah, I, that's definitely one of the gaps of the season is that whole idea. But I, I it sounds like we both kind of we both enjoyed the season. Yes, we're both looking forward to more Picard. For sure, of course, I'm very much looking forward to season two whenever they actually start shooting it. Right. We hope you've enjoyed this review and recap for season one of Picard. If you'd like to share with us your thoughts on the season, email us at deepspacepride at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter at deepspacepride. We'd love to hear from you. Give us your thoughts on the season and any other thoughts on our future episodes. And that's it for this week. So we hope you've enjoyed this episode. Thanks for listening. Bye for now. Bye, guys. Deep Space Pride is a production of Coconut Media Works. Executive producers Bill Smith and Dan Davidson. For more great Star Trek discussion, discover the other shows of the Trek Geeks podcast network at trekgeeks.com or find us in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app.
なくなった！